I mean, another one off the cuff here. I how do you maintain a large code base? I mean, this this is a really broad question, but obviously you have to have some kind of source management. I'll tell you a story. So I came onto an operations team. It was kind of a dream team that they I got invited to. It was really nice being invited, and um, and I uh, was actually referred from a friend, and they said you should go for this position. I said okay, so I did, and they when I was in the design meeting, one of the things that they asked was, um, you know, how are we going to organize this content and everything? And these were all operations people. They were admins and stuff. And that's what we call them back then. And I, so, I mean, I, I asked simple, silly questions like, how are we going to uniquely identify all of our, you know, machines in here and everything? And one of the things that I, I brought to the table in addition to that, that I remember that meeting was, well, how are we going to, you know, where's your source code? And it was all in a bunch of tarballs. And if you don't know what a tarball is, I'm not even kidding. Their entire code base was a ton of scripts that were all in tar and and gzip and they were just mixed over. And their backup process was like having it in two different shared drives. And I mean, they had no idea. They hadn't done any software development. This is a huge project. I mean, they, 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 it was a bunch of system administrators who really, really, really knew their system administrative stuff and they knew what they wanted. They knew what they wanted to make, but they had no software background at all, almost none. And it made me look really good because I, as I've said to other people, you know, if, if you're in an operations role and you are like the only person who codes, you're a star because, <laughs> you know, but whereas if you're in a, you know, in a room with a bunch of other lead coders and you're just an operations programmer, you're, you're know, like bottom of the totem pole and so I kind of, you know, have learned to code and stuff so going, going up that, that, that ladder there. But I, I would just say that you have to have source management and the story goes, they had none. And so I said, Hey, well, let's try this. And so I set up CBS. If you remember that, does anybody remember that? I don't think anybody remembers it. <laughs> it was a source management system. Uh, and then I set up subversion after that, that was like two or three years after that. And then right right before I left that team, uh, I set everything up on Git, and we we pushed, started putting everything into Git. Git was crazy hard compared to CVN, by the way, or Subversion. I, I hated it. I hated Git when I first started using it. I still think it's overly complicated. I don't think it needs to be as complicated as it is. Um, it's just over engineered because it came from Torvalds, and that's fine. But anyway, so you got to have source management in there. Uh, how do you how do you organize your code? Maybe that's another question you're asking. So, um, you know, so make, make sure you have some sort of, uh, source management. I don't know if that's the question though. I mean, I feel like, I feel like it is, uh, you know, there's a couple other things here. Um, yeah. <laughs> make sure you synchronize your Git repos, which is kind of Git does, you know, Make sure you have backups. I mean, that's obvious, right? You get that with Git, kind of. Um, what else? Uh, let me see where we are here. But but yeah, Git is, is pretty verbose, yeah. Um, I see some other questions coming in here. Let me go back. So I don't I see if anybody's trying to talk about this particular question. So... I, I don't really you manage huge code bases. I the, the big question is, uh, ask yourself this: ask yourself, uh, does this need its own version? Uh, does this need its own version for tracking? And this is a huge question because that that is really going to help you decide whether to break your code base up or not. Uh, I've gone back and forth on this over the years. Sometimes I break it out too much. Sometimes I'm not enough. Uh, depending on who you talk to, for example, the entire Node NPM community is very, very small. Uh, Pearl CPAN community, moderately sized, kind of all over the place. Um, Go community tends to be larger packages or to have multiple packages in a single module that can be imported independently. So it's kind of the best of both of those things. Rust has got cargo, but I don't know what idiomatic, you know, packages look like. I don't know if they tend to make them big or small or whatever. But the the one thing that 
really helps drive home the decision is if I change something in this code and I and my version gets bumped up, what will happen? So am I going to screw up everybody who is using it? And or am I going to, you know, if I go in here and I change the documentation on one of my functions, is it going to force a sem somatic version upgrade on my entire massive monolith package, right? So, so I think that that's, that that's one of the, the ways to go about that. Um, I, another thing too, is I would use, uh, uh, consider, I would con consider more powerful, uh, IDEs for large code bases, uh, and Emacs. So I am not an Emacs user. Uh, so for example, if I had, if I was using a symbol and it was used, you know, 10,000 times in my entire huge code base, uh, I, I don't, I, I think it's a bad practice anyway, first of all, I don't, I don't think you should do that, but you know, if, if you do those kind of things, I, I think you might be, if you have a monolithic thing, you might want to consider a more powerful idea or Emacs. The only real justification people hear me, you know, say that I like them and you can do everything with it. And there are people, the entire, the most of the Linux kernel developers do not use Emacs. Most of them use Vim. There's a lot of them use Emacs, including Torvalds uses a slimmed down tiny version of Emacs. So, but when you're dealing with a large code base, things like that, things that have intelligent knowledge about all the code, like, you know, you know, whatever, you know, um, what's the one, what's the big old one? There's another big one, Eclipse, you know, things like that, that makes sense, right? So I, I don't like it, but if you're going to use a bigger, that's probably a thing to ask a software developer though, they'll tell you, uh, because they need to make like really massive changes across the whole code base and stuff like that. Personally, I don't ever like my code bases to get that unwieldy. Uh, I would rather have a bunch of go modules in their own git repos that are independently managed uh and and end up with like 50 60 70 dependencies than than to have a big ass single project that has symbols that go across the whole board um in go there's actually the replace directive in go.mod so that if uh some sort of symbol name does change uh, you can deal with it that way. In fact, and you can also do a uh, symbol reassignment with var, which is really nice. I, I've done, I've used that a lot. So like if somebody actually changes the name of a symbol, you can set a variable in your package that equals the old name to the new name. And as long as the signatures and stuff on the function haven't changed or the, the actual, whatever it's referring to hasn't changed, it's hundred percent okay to do that. And, and I've seen them use that a lot when they've been migrating through Unicode and stuff in the Go code base. So those are some methods from doing it. I, I that's just, just kind of off the cuff. So I don't know if that answered the question, but... <laughs>